Good morning, friends. You have to stay on mute because singing on Zoom is a disaster. But I put some lyrics in the chat and I want you to sing along. Since you're on mute, you, if you think you're not a good singer, I think I'm not a good singer, uh, it, it doesn't matter. So, so, so sing out, sing out. I'm going to invite my sweetheart in here to the frame with me. Oh, no. And, uh, and we're going to sing this thing. All right. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Cause I don't want to run this race in vain. Hold my hand while I run this race. Hold my hand while I run this race. Hold my hand while I run this race. Cause I don't want to run this race in vain. Stand by me while I run this race. Please stand by me while I run this race. Stand by me while I run this race, cause I don't want to run this race in vain. I'm your child while I run this race. I'm your child while I run this race. I'm your child while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Search my heart while I run this race. Please search my heart while I run this race. Search my heart while I run this race, cause I don't want to run this race in vain. Come on, y'all. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. No, I don't want to run this race in vain. Thanks, y'all. You sounded wonderful. I saw Polly Washburn bopping. Looking good. Well, some of you may know that my general style when I'm asked to do a talk is I, I allow myself to be prepared by spirit. And I might have some little, little card that I write four things on. <laughs> and uh, in the old Quaker tradition, I just allow spirit to come through me and bring the language. And this has been an amazing experiment for me. You've probably clued into the fact that all week I have been reading verbatim uh, text that I prepare. And it's generally been that I, I, uh, I, get, I get done with our morning time and then I, uh, I, 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 I check in with my committee and then I, I have a snack and I go for a walk and I come back and I prepare the next day. And my feeling has been that I've been as accompanied and companioned by spirit in writing this whole thing out um, as, I, as I have ever been just speaking extemporaneously. So what I want to tell you is uh, this morning is a little more relying on spirit. Um, I don't know if I got tired or if... Uh, I was so relieved to be through those really hard topics of, of uh, repentance and death and uh, resurrection, um, but uh, uh, it's not so clear to me what we're doing this morning. So I've jotted a lot of things down and uh, we're gonna see what comes up. There are some pieces I know, I know we're gonna treat with. Okay, so when I was a kid, my parents shared the cooking. Now, to be honest, neither of them was ever going to win Top Chef, though the homemade bread was very good. 
To be efficient, they often doubled recipes so that there would be enough for another meal. There was five of us. And sometimes this was a delightful reprise. And sometimes there was an element of, oh, no, not again. I will say that it was always wholesome and nutritious. My parents were all about the organics before that was a big thing. Though it is, of course, how food was grown for millennia before the industrial food system. I'm grateful that my palate was trained to appreciate real food. They think now that a child's palate is trained and then when they later get food independence, they might eat some junk, but, but then if they wanna come back to a wholesome diet, their, their palate appreciates that wholesome diet. And if they've been raised on junk, that's what they always crave. So, uh, so I'm grateful that I was raised on whole foods, some of which came out of the backyard garden. And in fact, I'm grateful that they raised me up with a wholesome spiritual diet as well in the Mill Valley and Sacramento Friends Meeting and the Pacific Yearly Meeting. I was a weird kid, really a geek and a misfit. I'm still a geek and a misfit. And uh, in my yearly meeting, I found a peer group that, uh, that appreciated and celebrated everybody, regardless of our quirks. <laughs> um, so, Sometimes towards the end of the week, one parent or other would pull out of the refrigerator a whole bunch of Tupperware containers. My grandmother was a Tupperware sales lady and put all those leftovers together into a meal of sorts. Now, sometimes two soups were combined with interesting results. And sometimes it was just seven little mounds of different things on the plate. So we're going to have some leftovers today. And, uh, I hope there's a feeling of, uh, of, uh, of delight and not, uh, oh no, uh, not that. They're not things you've heard before. It's not leftovers in that sense. It's more in the sense of the loaves and the fishes where um, I started the week with a little basket of loaves and fishes, these things I knew I wanted to say. And I finished the week with uh, many more baskets <laughs> of, of things. Um, so, so we're going we're gonna to look at some of those. But before that, I want to give thanks for all the support I have received. And uh, this is not a pro forma thing. Uh, I don't think anyone that, that I might mention uh, expects to be thanked. But I'm doing it intentionally because I want you to understand that while you're seeing my face in the little magic light box, um, there, is a, there is a cadre of people holding me up. A living cloud of witnesses. And I believe that's how we're meant to do Quaker ministry. Um, so I want to I wanna make it transparent. So first of all, my elder, Scott Bell, who knows how to ask me the right questions. My anchor committee is Elaine Emily, Rachel Finley, John McCarthy, and Sally Hyman. And they have accompanied me for over a decade in my stumbling efforts to be faithful. Mi corazón. Mika Estrada, my heart, who knows me better than anyone and loves me anyway. She blesses my life. Some others who were willing to accompany me in this work, holding me, but also holding you, holding you, the body, that you might be fed. These are Valerie Nutman, Sharon Lloyd, and Zachary Moon, who's my ministry consultant and my brother. <laughs> A small army of folks work to provide energy healing to my voice and my back including Valerie, Sharon, Elaine, Mika, Jan Stansel of the Healing Center, and Polly Washburn. I am much healthier today than I was on Monday, actually, which <clears throat> I hope you can hear in my voice. On Monday, it was pretty, pretty thin. Uh, many thanks to you healers for helping me show up for this. I'll just say a little thing. Polly told me that she was doing some Reiki work on my head energy work and she removed some congestion and I was like well the one problem I'm not having is congestion I sometimes have bad allergies but I've noticed this funny thing since Monday which is my left ear which is usually closed is open and I can hear in stereo so there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy Horatio thank you Polly I'm loving it I hope it doesn't go away uh, FGC has been awesome to work with. We traveled through the virtual gathering decision together, the FGC theme decision, and other twists and turns. I want to say that uh, Brother Barry Crosno is the right person in the right place for FGC in this time of turmoil. Lori Sinitsky and Ruth Re Reber provided seamless support. 
Marta Rusek, who made a podcast a couple of months ago of a conversation she had with me and Quaker chaplains Larry Keeler and Blake Arnall. Um, there's, we, we could link to that uh, FTC page in the chat, or you can find it on my page, which will be on the chat. There's a link to it. Um, but Marta is just a consummate problem solver uh, with the soul of a poet. Uh, the worship committee holds its work so tenderly. I've got to tell you guys, we had to do some grief work, a little grief work, informal, with the with the worship with the worship committee when the the gathering had to go virtual. They had this whole beautiful vision, and they were a little despondent at first. And I hope that they are feeling much better now and happy with the result of their labors to bring a sense of worship to this whole FGC gathering for you in cyberspace. I think they've been very successful. Sabrina McCarthy, Marianne Dahlke, Charles Finn, Ruth Reber, David Etheridge, Ruth Fitz, David Fitz, Linda Goldstein, Elizabeth Pearsall Schmidt, Barbara Von Salas, Anne Pomeroy, and Olivia Pandulfi. Pandolfi have been part of the FGC crew that have, have been helping everything happen, and me, uh, by half hours, that is. FGC's Regina Renee Ward provided spiritual support, advice, and direction, meaning the occasional loving smack upside the head. And I'm grateful to Vanessa July for bringing her racial justice ministry to the West Coast so many times and for creating a space for friends of color to do our spiritual work. Anne Jerome has been my operator. While I have dropped down into the matrix of spirit, of spirit trying to find Neo, trying to visit the Oracle, avoid Mr. Smith, and decipher the code, she has been sitting at the console working the controls with cheerfulness, attention, and willingness. You should know that I usually send her the links, email addresses, videos, photos, and other oddments less than an hour before we start, because that's when I start to understand what we're doing. Anne's had help from Holly Baldwin and Rachel Ernst Stallhut. It has been a gift for me to have a lot of family here. You are all my spiritual family, of course, and it has been a special treat to have my father, Joe Magruder, his partner, Heather Levine, my sister, Marie Schoenholtz, my stepmother, Laura Mignani, my aunt, Maggie Hutchinson, and my brother, Zachary Moon, who teaches chaplaincy at Chicago Theological Seminary in the space. I feel my mother, Joanne Magruder, with me in spirit. I want to presence these people because they make it possible for spirit to use this imperfect vessel. There is no such thing as a solitary Quaker. I could not do this work without their support. I am so grateful for this opportunity to be of service. Now next on the smorgasbord is my just started website for Soulways Spiritual Accompaniment. If you need to get in touch with me, you can email me through that site. The link uh, to that the FGC chaplain's interview uh, with Marta Rusek can be found there, although it's on the FGC website. And um, Mika and I are going to work on the website a little bit and develop it after she's done being the plenary speaker for Pacific Yearly Meeting and we take a week of restoration and napping in the hammock. So th those links are in the chat. Now, nobody put me up to this, but if you have money that you can share, all manner of Quaker and other vital enterprises have become seriously anemic financially because of COVID and the collapse of our economy. And those organizations need an infusion. So use your own discernment, of course, you know whether you have money to spare and where you want it to go, but choose organizations that you see as the imaginal discs we need to grow the butterfly that comes out of this nutrient soup. Otherwise, those organizations may perish just when they are needed most. If you are part of a Quaker institution that is sitting on giant piles of ancient endowment, I'm calling on you to consider giving or loaning some resources to smaller organizations that need to bridge this time and could perish without an infusion that you might never miss. I'll just share that one year when I was working at the John Woolman School here in California, we had had to take out a mortgage to uh, to meet operating expenses. And uh, there was a school in the East Coast, a Quaker school that received an endowment, 1% of which would have retired not only our mortgage, but our entire debt. 
and that school may or may not survive this time. So let's spread the love. <laughs> if it's old money, it might be a little suspect anyway, built on the backs of stolen land and the labor of African slaves. So let's take a risk, people. Invest in what we cherish, recognizing the possibility that this is the time we have been saving for. I don't think I've ever asked people for money before in my life. <laughs> I could have been more awkward. So today's the day of gifts, gifts of the spirit. Some of them are trickster gifts, so beware. <laughs> and this is where I'm just going to sort of pick out of the basket, okay? So the first is the gift of lamentation. Now, we did a, a lot of lamentation on, uh, we did a lot of lamentation on the day that we looked at death. And uh, we just, dis we discovered that it was important and that it was uh, um, life-giving, right? And I, I encouraged you all to write your own, um, uh, to write your own lament. And I did receive one that I want to share with you. It's written as a, as a kind of a, a poem. So many words talking in our world. How can we hear with new ears until the world cracks open with catastrophe? That moment that changes newspaper print to a slice in our hearts. Now we can hear the words, even when spoken yet again, feel the wrench of them and taste the blood behind them, binding us one to another across words and even beyond death. You can feel that, right? You can feel the power of lament. So, one of the things I like about that particular lament is it starts with the pain and the loss, but it moves to justice. And that's what happens with public lamentation, which is a strong biblical tradition. Cornell West teaches us about the African-American sense of tragicomedy and combining it with the Hebrew yearning for justice, tzedakah. And you see that in these public funerals where there's a, a wrongful killing of an unarmed black person, and then there's a big public televised funeral. Maybe some dignitaries there, but surely the family will talk. Probably the mother will talk. George Floyd called out for his mother when he was dying. She'd been gone for years. But others spoke at his funeral. I saw a mural of his face in, a, in an, uh, an Asian country. I can't remember which there was, there were people were rallying with a mural of George uh, Floyd's face. Um, so that he, he lives on through that public lamentation. So I wanna say that when we're moving forward into action, we need to not skip that step. We have to know that our hearts are broken, but that they're broken open so that we can then be filled with light and love and then go forward in our activism, in our yearning for tzedakah, for justice from that place. So this brings us to activism. And I want to say we have been unbelievably blessed. I have been unbelievably blessed by our evening plenaries. I mean, there's been a spirit of play. There's been beautiful performances, spontaneity. Um, I really, I really enjoyed Valerie Cower last night, and she, she touched on this. But I want to just tie it to our tradition um, for a moment. And I, I and I'm, I'm reading the Testament of Devotion by Thomas Kelly here. And if you are wanting to keep this feeling of spiritual renewal that you have. Um, here, I want you to, uh, to think about just taking Thomas Kelly's book with you um, as you go, uh, because it, it can do that for you. He writes that paradoxically, we, we did a lot with paradox, right? 
Paradoxically, this total instruction proceeds in two opposing directions at once. We are torn loose from earthly attachments and ambitions, contemptus mundi, contempt for the world, and we are quickened to a divine but painful concern for the world, amour mundi, love for the world. He plucks the world, he, God, plucks the world out of our hearts, loosening the chains of attachment, and he hurls the world into our hearts, where we and he together carry it in infinitely tender love. John Woolman said, you know, love was the first emotion, and then he went on this dangerous <laughs> trip that people didn't want him to take to go and meet with the Indians and see how they were experiencing their inward spiritual lives. We must always remember that love is the first motion. Otherwise, it's, and I should have pulled this text up. I know Regina Renee could give this to us verbatim, but you know it. It's where Paul says, without love, I am a clanging gong and a sounding cymbal and uh, that, that nothing I can give my body to be burned and none of it means anything if, if I have not love as what's moving me. So let's, let's definitely recognize we're in a moment in time and that it is critical and that it is timely. Uh, if you've read any Naomi Klein and the shock doctrine, you know, there are people who are look for these kinds of disasters to put in, you know, a decrease in civil liberties or, you know, damaging economic uh, uh, subsidies or laws. And we do need to be quick and we do need to be uh, people of our moment, but we need to come from love. So if we have to take time to lament and pray, then we need to do that. I, I think there's something wrong with my clock because it says we have eight minutes to nine and that's ridiculous. So I'm gonna sort through this. I'm gonna sort through the baskets of collected bread um, for a minute. Okay, there's one that I really have to do it's very long and it's very complex and it's all written out and it's probably long and complex because I was so afraid of making a mistake in part. So hold me in prayer because I'm going to, I'm going to edit it here. So it's about paradoxes. Jesus is a paradox. He's born of a virgin. He's God's Messiah, but he doesn't have a pot to put things in. He's a God, but he's a man. He's a great spiritual leader, but he's no earthly qualifications. He has no worldly power. The African-American trickster hero is Br'er Rabbit, who came across in the slave ships wrapped in the head, the head wrapping of a Ghanaian woman, I'm convinced. And Br'er Rabbit is this tiny little powerless rabbit right but he always outsmarts the fox and that was an important message for african americans they might not have worldly power but that they were tough that we were tough and smart and that we would eventually out outsmart the fox who was trying to persecute us uh jesus acts in all kinds of paradoxical ways uh it's all very very interesting and i'm not going to do it um Paradox says all, Jesus says all kinds of really uh, paradoxical things. And I want to say that when Jesus speaks in a pedagogical parabola of paradoxical parables, pericopes, and postulations, a pericope is a Bible scholar way of saying story, but it just sounds more intellectual. Um, he's trying to break our patterns of thought so that new light can come in, right? Metanoia, so that we can change our thinking, we can repent. And the Beatitudes start with three apparently contradictory statements. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When I was in my late 20s, I went through a period of a dark night of the soul. And I realized at some point that I could not pull myself out of it with my cleverness or my willpower or even the friends and resources that were around me and that I had to surrender to it. And when I surrendered to it, I found a, a new basis for my existence. 
And then I read Parker Palmer's Let Your Life Speak, and that made it okay. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for that, too. So that's what it is to be poor in spirit. When we're hammered open, that's when, that's when the kingdom of heaven can find us. If you can find it without being hammered open, God bless you. But it's, it's a little unusual for most of us. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We touched on that with the activism. The meaning of mourning is sort of the Quaker meaning of to have a concern, to carry it in your heart, and to carry it in your heart so deeply that from the heart space you're motivated to move on it. And whether it changes in your lifetime, slavery was abolished a hundred years after a woman's life. Whether it changes in your lifetime or not, you're comforted by the company that you find and having a sense that you're doing the work that God has set before you. Thirdly, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. This is a gift that's a little thorny, friends. I want, to, I want to parse the Greek for you a little bit. You know, I never do that for fun, but only to find a deeper meaning. The Greek word that we translate as meek is praus. It's a term from horse training. And when the Roman military got a herd of horses, they would work with them to see which, what each one was good at. Some had no real use for humans. Some were good for drawing a cart or a wagon. Some were acceptable saddle horses. I'm not an equestrian guy, but I used to go to the state fair and uh, watch the draft horse classic, or the county fair in Nevada County, rather. There's these big, beautiful horses and some mules, and they could, you know, turn in place and drag a log through a zigzag course with a person standing on the log holding the reins. There was one big percher on there who would kneel down with this special saddle with sort of straps and a framework and give rides to kids with disabilities. So gentle, beautiful creatures of God. So the horses that the Romans prized the most because they were a warlike culture was the ones that were big and strong and fast and could learn to respond to voice commands, whether the rider was sitting on their back or standing a ways away, to respond to inputs from the rider's legs because a soldier needs their arms for other things. And they had to be able to back up, uh, which is not something horses like to do, and not startle at loud sounds, continue to follow directions when they were injured, and get along well with other horses. These war horses were praus. They were meek. They were teachable and biddable and could learn. Now, I'd forgotten that Greek word, so I had to look it up, and it struck me that Quakers are not meek. I mean, we're quiet meeting for worship and we're pacifists, but we have leaned into our individualistic roots over the years, which was a healthy direction for Quakerism when it started, uh, because that was a time when all sorts of individuals, uh, if they were women or children or non-Christians, weren't fully people. And, uh, and Quakers understood better and, and celebrated each, each one, because each one had that of God within them. But individualism, as you know, it can go too far. I'm on the Faith and Practice Revision Committee for yearly meeting, my yearly meeting, and I realized one day that there's not a single theological premise that we have consensus on. Probably not even a smaller group, like a monthly meeting could find consensus. And so with our continuing revelation and universal, universalism and activism and tolerance, we become a haven for proud, uh, defiant people like me, um, who, who, who don't want to come under any particular uh, discipline. And, uh, and therefore, um, we don't have the unity that we might have. Um, we resist elders and eldering. Uh, we think eldering is finger wagging, but eldering is nurturing. Uh, I couldn't be here today without my elders. Um, we've made a, the distinction between member and attender very amorphous because we don't want to we don't want to have a line. We don't want to make people uncomfortable. I've come to accept that the word oversight or overseer is troubling to some friends, and not only friends of color. I confess that it does not trigger me, and it is dear to my heart because I am a wayward sinner who needs gentle terrestrial comfort and correction, support and accountability from time to time. 
I think of the time that Joe Franco was on the East Coast in one of those great historical meeting houses where he was invited to sit on the four-tiered facing bench with that big sound reflector behind it. And he sat in worship. And as he sat, his mind was directed to the figure of a woman towards the back and off to the side away from others. Her face was in her hands and her shoulders were shaking and she was in great distress. And his heart went out to her and he prayed for her all through the meeting as she became more composed. And after meeting, she was talking with some others. And he realized he could see where she was because he was a little higher up on that facing bench. And that, that was what overseer meant, to be responsible and able to see the trouble and needs of those gathered. Now, I've accepted that the term overseer has to go. It's, it's, there's no point in putting a stake in the ground there um, if, that, if that word is troubling to people. But what I'm hoping is that we won't replace it with a word that doesn't have the same meaning, the same sense of support and accountability, because we need that. So I just want to offer that, that the meek shall inherit the earth. Uh, just for you to reflect on, is there some, some ways that we need to examine ourselves? The last paradoxical saying, it's nine o'clock, what? I have to do this very quickly. I hope it's okay because, uh, because I, I really put my foot in it. I received a very gentle, respectful email from a friend who finds a lot of value in, in worshiping with and studying with uh, conservative Jewish folks in their neighborhood. And this friend called to my attention that my little dig at Leviticus was, was not okay. And I wanna apologize for that. I think that's right. I think that's right. Even if Jesus was trying to call people to a deeper understanding of God that sort of included, okay, included, but also sort of exceeded the, the structures and statutes that helped Jewish people to be, uh, to be faithful and to also to be distinctive, like Quakers had our distinctives, um, there is no reason to ever disrespect anyone else's sacred text. Um, and certainly not where the, the legacy of Christian supersessionism, uh, which is the idea that Christianity supersedes Judaism, has caused so much hell. And so I apologize for that. And I guess while I'm at it, I will just say that in the hospital, I have on many occasions found uh, the Apostles' Creed and other very performative rites and rituals, such as the Catholic sacrament for the sick, to be amazingly sacred, holy, and healing. So I took some shots at the Apostles' Creed, but what Fox said was forms without power. And what I say is that there are times those forms might not have power, but there are times when they are the most powerful and best medicine that anyone can have. I have another piece. <laughs> But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just save it. Maybe when these transcripts are published, FGC will put them up and I'll include it then. Thank you, friends.